Well, good morning, and thank you so very much for coming out today and being here as we honor and celebrate Marcy's life. I got a question for you. How many of you have ever been to a celebration service of life for somebody 100 years or older? Not? Okay, a few of you. All right, not very many. I, uh, the first one I went to was my neighbors that I grew up next to. Uh, when we moved in and I was 10, um, our neighbor was about 90, and uh, it, I was in my early 20s, and I went back over to see him, and uh, he was out in the driveway one day, and I walked over, and I said, Mr. Watkins, how are you today? He was sitting in his wheelchair, and he said, oh, Tim, if I can make it to my next birthday, I'll have it made, and I said, well, Mr. Watkins, how old will you be on your next birthday? He said, oh, Tim, I'll be 100. I said, wow, Mr. Watkins. I said, but I, that's pretty cool. But I don't understand. How will you have it made if you make it to your 100th birthday? He said, Tim, I read the obituaries every day. You just don't see many people dying after 100. <laughs> And uh, he actually made it to 103, and his wife made it to 101. They were absolutely incredible. Whatever it was they were drinking, I needed to get some of that because it worked out really, really good for them. Uh, this is not going to be your normal service because um, how do we do all this? Marcel, Billy, Marcy, Wright, Wygant, Power. She lived a very full, diverse, and exciting life, and she wrote a lot of what I'm supposed to say today. All right? So if it gets just a wee bit longer than you think, it is not my fault today. All right? Because Marcy had a lot she wanted to have said today, and so we're going to do our very best to accommodate all that. I, um, I got the call when she went into ER at Fresno Community Hospital to go see her. And uh, it, it was not easy to get in, but they finally let me in. And uh, when I walked in, quite frankly, at that moment, I wasn't sure she was still breathing. And uh, very, very shallow. And she was laying on her side and I pulled up a chair next to her and I patted her on the hand and it was warm and uh, after a moment or two her eyes fluttered and she looked at me and she said oh pastor I got a favor to ask you and I said well what's that Marcy I'll do my very best and she said when you preach my funeral will you talk really loud so I can hear you <laughs> And I said, even in those moments, uh, her personality and her humor came out when um, we, uh, when I met with her niece and we were at uh, uh, well, the hospital, they had transitioned her over to a, a therapy home and trying to see what they could do for her next. And there wasn't much they could do. She had been back to ER and then back to them at the rehab center. And uh, they had called Heinz Hospice to come and do an evaluation and she would see if she was appropriate for hospice care at that moment. And um, so uh, Sherry and I had given some information in the room before we went into where Marcy was. And then we walked in and, and uh, Marcy's much more alert this day than the day I saw her in ER. And uh, she's laying there in her bed. She's actually looking wonderful. And the nurse patted her and she said, um, uh, Marcy, do you have any pain? And Marcy looked at her and said, well, I've lived under the principle, I would rather be the pain than have a pain. <laughs> and then she asked something about her marriage or if she was married. And she said, well, yes, I have been. And she said, but you know, I always have advice for husbands. Why would you go out for a hamburger when you got steak at home? <laughs> And I'm looking at it, I wanted to say, Marcy, would you tone it down just a little bit? We're trying to get you into a great facility, all right? They can look after you, and they're going to think you're too sharp for this. But that was Marcy. Uh, in the 11 or 12 years that I had the privilege of knowing her, she was just a spitfire. I'm glad all of you are here together today. Family and friends, you make a difference for each other. Marcy had a love for the Lord that was spontaneous and spunky and fiery and um, she talked about him unashamedly and he is here today um, to offer us encouragement and hope as we remember and honor her. I always like to do my best to set a, our thinking in a perspective. I, I don't know how everybody shows up at a service like this and we all have 
different perspectives of the way in which we approach uh, life, sickness, death, what's on the other side. Um, but our perspective is what shapes um, our attitudes and the way in which we will walk away from here. And um, usually I like to try to find something that's connected to their life to try to set perspective. I can't make you believe anything about how you want to live the rest of your life, how you want to face your death, and what you may think is on the other side. I, I, I know what God would love for us to experience in all of this, but we have to make those decisions of whether we're going to trust his leadership in that or try to pilot our own course through these things that we know so little about. Um, I know that she was uh, connected to the RV group, Toe and Go. How many of you were here from Toe and Go? I know they're on a, there's some on a big trip, all right, another group that she's with. Look at all of you, man. Awesome. I understand she was a member of your organization for 75 years, and she paid her dues this year, all right? She would like a refund, all right? And... Uh, but anyway, it, it's sometimes hard to find things connected to RV that sets perspective. But I think I found a couple, so let me see if we can do this. Uh, there was a, a, a young, inexperienced thief who thought the easiest way to steal gas for his car was to siphon it out of somebody else's tank. And you know what siphoning is, right? You stick a rubber hose in a gas tank, suck on one end, and you know when you get a mouthful of gas, you spit it out, and you fill your tank with the flow. Well, that makes somewhat sense. Well, there was an inexperienced thief in Seattle. He was young, and he decided to siphon gas from Dennis Quigley's motorhome. When Dennis, who happened to be inside his motorhome at the time, heard noises outside, he investigated. He looked out the window, only to find the thief curled up on the ground, vomiting violently. What happened? Well, the thief, being inexperienced, made a serious mistake. Instead of putting the hose in the tube where the gasoline is, he put it in the sewage tank line. Oh, perspective, it makes all the difference in the world how things turn out. He was only 14 years old, and the police, as well as Dennis Quigley, decided they wouldn't press charges. They thought he had suffered enough already. Merv Krasinski was from Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. He purchased a brand new 32-foot Winnebago motorhome. It was his first trip. He was out on the freeway. He set the cruise control at 70 miles an hour. Everything was going well. He calmly left the driver's seat and went back to make himself a cup of coffee. <laughs> Not surprisingly, the RV left the freeway, crashed and overturned. Mr. Krasinski sued Winnebago for not advising him in the owner's manual that he couldn't actually do such a thing. <laughs> the rest of the story is this. The courts awarded him $1.7 million and a new motor home. And the company now has in all of their manuals, you cannot leave your seat while the motor vehicle is in operation. I am not sure what you had figured when you came here today, but I trust you will allow Marcy's life story and maybe even her faith to influence you to write some new paragraphs of your own. So let's jump in and get started talking about this 102-year-old life. She was born in Quinton, Oklahoma. Any of you all ever been to Quinton, Oklahoma? I have, okay? It ain't very big. It's in Choctaw Nation, all right, of Oklahoma. It's on the eastern side. It currently has a population of 1,051 people. Um, she was born on March the 25th, 1920. I don't know if Joe knows the day of the week that your mother was born on. She was born on a Thursday. Okay, so she got here in time for the weekend. Here's an interesting tidbit about Quentin, Oklahoma. It was named after Elizabeth Quentin. She was a Choctaw, and she lived to be 116. I think it's in the water in Quentin, all right? And it made an impact. Had, had uh, Marcy stayed there, she might have passed her up, all right? But she came to California. At the time that she was born, Woodrow Wilson was the 28th president of the United States. Do you happen to know what number our current president is? 
He is 46. Just kind of think that through for a moment. How many presidents she saw come and go. Um, there were movies in the theater at the time she was born, believe it or not. There were no talking movies, however. That didn't come till seven years later, all right? But there were uh, silent movies. And what came out that year, the very first version of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde that starred John Barrymore, all right? He was one of the top screen actors who didn't have to talk. Last of the Mohegans with Wallace Beery, another premier actor of his day. Pollyanna. All right, with uh, Mary Pickford. And then I love this title, Molly Coddle, with Douglas Fairbanks Sr., not Jr., and Wallace Beery also in that. There were some music hits. Most of us are probably not going to know one of these. Swanee, Tell Me, and You Ain't Heard Nothing Yet were all top songs done by the same guy. Anybody know who it might be who sang those three songs? Who knew that back there? Well, do you two guys, you don't look old enough to know that. You still have color in your hair. Oh, I, I will. <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll, I'll have it into my 90s. Okay, all right. Good, good, good. Uh, that is correct. Then there was another guy whispering the Japanese Sandman and Wang Wang Blues. Don't you love some of these titles? Do you know who sang those three hit songs? Okay, uh, that was Paul Whitman saying those three. Uh, she shared her birthday with some rather famous people, and one of them actually is infamous. One of them born on the same day, March the 25th, these are all different years, but the same day, was a guy by the name of Jack Ruby. Does that name ring a bell? Yeah, he committed murder. He killed Lee Harvey Oswald for killing the president. All right? So uh, some thinks he's infamous. Some thought he was a hero, probably. But anyway, that is God calling, telling me to hurry up. <laughs> and Jack was born in 1911. It gets a little better. My favorite football commentator, Howard Cosell, was born on the same day in 1918. He was two years before Marcy was born. And then a model and singer and a Christian author, her name was Anita Bryant. You might remember that name. I think she sold orange juice, didn't she? I think she was in orange juice commercials. She was born in 1940. And then the gal who could tinkle the ivories and sing like an angel, Aretha Franklin, shared the same birthday. Her parents were Imogene and Ralph Wright, and Marcy was the only child. That explains a lot, doesn't it? Marcy left Oklahoma as a young teenager. She lived briefly with an aunt in Evanston, Illinois. Her mom thought that would be a good experience for her. I think it was for the summer. But while she was living with her aunt, her aunt gave her permission to be a model for a swimsuit illustrator for Esquire magazine. <laughs> She got paid $30 a portrait, all right, for him letting her take pictures. When her mother found out about it, she was mad at the sister, and she made Marcy come home. Uh, it wasn't long after that that, of course, the impact of the Dust Bowl hit, and they left Oklahoma like many of our relatives did, and they moved to California. She attended Fresno High, and she graduated in 1938. Any of you here? who graduated high school or attended high school with her? I didn't think so. During her senior year, she met Joe Power. Joe Power was one to two years. I've read two different stories she's written, so I'm not sure if he was one or two years younger. He might have been two years by his birthday and one year behind in college or vice versa. I'm not sure because I've, I've read it two ways. But anyway, I think Marcy was the original cougar. Okay, she went after a younger man, and it was during her senior year she met Joe. He was a military cadet in the military cadet program there, and I think Marcy. Well, I already said that. Marcy described her first date as a picnic and a swim at Lane's Bridge, and it must have been a good one because uh, it convinced Joe that she really was Miss Wright. And because they were married uh, just a few months after he graduated high school, September the 3rd, 1939. That was Labor Day weekend. They were married at a neighbor of his sister's Ethel's home. In 1940, he joined the military. And uh, not long after that, 
uh, he was away from home. Their nearly six-year marriage was blessed with two sons. Joseph Power, who went on to take his stepdad's name as well, Wygant, and then his brother Maurice. And I, I'm a little slow sometimes, but I just figured this out. I didn't figure it out when we did Joe's service, but preparing for Marcy's today, I just realized you, of course, were named after your dad, and your brother was named after your mother, wasn't he? Maurice, Marcel, makes sense to me. Here's Marcy's own words about marrying Captain Power. So he said, Joe and I were high school sweethearts and we married in September after we graduated. We had two precious sons. Joe was in the National Guard and then went to U.S. service in 1940. After Pearl Harbor, he went to Fort Lewis Army Base. He was a staff sergeant. His commanding officer recommended him for OCS, Officer Candidate School at Fort Benning, Georgia. I was told he was going to be an FBI man. That stands for Fort Benning Idiot. <laughs> Marcy wrote this, okay? Just let me clarify. <clears throat> When he got his bars, the military asked him where he would be stationed. He said, California. So they sent him to Florida. I had a very good job in defense at the time. She was a Rosie the Riveter, all right, during those days, working for the government. So we decided I would stay here, put money away for our future. That was a big mistake. He was still young. He was immature. He was lonely. And he wandered off. I was truly heartbroken. He married a year later. I remarried three years later. I'll tell you more of that story in a minute. I was married to a very wonderful man named Howard Wygant. He was a police officer. We were married for almost 56 years. But I sort of told you the end of the story before I told you the beginning of the story. Uh, this is what was given to me that she typed out. So I decided rather than to retype it, I'll just read parts out of her story. I'm not going to read every page, all right, so that'll make you feel better, but I'm going to cover most of it. She said, my, uh, my high school sweetheart, who I married September the 3rd, 1939, we had divorced. I was working now as an auto mechanic. Can you imagine that? One day I was finishing a repair on a customer's pickup truck, and I noticed a blonde lady circling the garage. Then she left, and I told my boss about the incident. He laughed and said, I think that was Harry's wife. Harry Wygant owned the pickup. A little later, Ruth returned, got out of her car and said, my husband said you were a good mechanic and I'm fascinated that a cute red-headed girl like you is doing auto repair. Remember, Marcy wrote this. That cute little redhead, all right. At that point, I took a break and Ruth and I began talking. I told her about my divorce and my two sons. She told me she had a really nice brother-in-law in the army and suggested I write to him. I told her I was done with men, and I would not consider writing to someone I didn't even know. A wonderful friendship developed between Ruth and I. She invited me and my children to the family gatherings, would mention her brother-in-law, but I refused to listen. Several months later, she called and asked, what was I doing? And I told her, I'd just gotten home from church, and I was going to relax, and the boys were spending a few days with her dad. She said, great, how about going for a ride with me? I asked her, where are we going? She said, oh, around Roding Park. She picked me up and away we went. We got to Roding Park and she was driving pretty fast for that area of town. I said, Ruth, you're squealing your tires. You need to slow down or you'll get a ticket. I looked in the rear view mirror and I saw the flashing lights of a patrol car. The police officer walks up to the car, starts telling Ruth about the speed limits in Roding Park. Ruth says to me and says, Mark, I wasn't going that fast, was I? My curt reply was, I mean, Mars, I wasn't going that fast, was I? My curt reply was, I don't know, I wasn't watching your speedometer. They both started laughing and I said, hey, what's going on here? Ruth told me that he was the brother-in-law, Howard, that she had been trying to get me to write to. He came around to my side of the car. I had my hand around that bar where the wind wing, remember those days? The wind wing is located. Suddenly, I'm handcuffed to that bar. <laughs> my thought is, I'll ignore him and he'll just unlock the cuffs. We talked a while longer, then Ruth informs us that we have to go. I told her if he would unlock me, we could go. He starts fumbling in his pockets and says, uh-oh. Must have left my keys on the desk when I did my paperwork. You'll have to go to headquarters to get unlocked. 
This little redhead lost her temper. So he told me finally he was just teasing. He got the key and released me. He told me he probably knew about me. He probably knew more about me than I knew about him. Ruth had borrower, uh, borrowed a picture of me to show him. Uh, and by the way, you'll get a copy of that picture. All right. It's, you can't see it from here, but it's the middle one. These are going to be on your table in the reception area. It's one of those from the photo shoot for the Esquire magazine. All right. That's the one she sent to the brother. He called me a few days later and asked me to go to dinner in the movie Showboat. They were talking movies by now. We had a nice time and he was very much a gentleman, not like some of the other men I've dated. In fact, Howard and I dated about two months. He never held my hand, never tried to kiss me. We were just good friends. When we would get back from a date, he would pay my babysitter, make sure she got safely home across the street, and would leave me with, I'll call you later. One day, Dad had the boys. Howard brought me home. I unlocked the door and started to turn on the light. He grabbed me by the shoulders, turned me around, kissed me, and then ran for the car. <laughs> the next day, he called me and asked me if I was mad. And I said, well, why would I be mad? And he said, because I got fresh. Wow, was he shy. All right, I'm skipping a page here now. In the spring of 1946, Howard asked me if I'd like to go to Berkeley to meet his Aunt Kay and her husband Slim. I agreed. I was very impressed with both of them. It was getting near bedtime, and Aunt Kay said something to Howard in German. His face turned red, and he said, no German. I asked her in private what she said to him, and she replied, she asked him if we slept together. Well, Aunt Kay and I shared a bed together, and Howard and Slim shared the bed. Oh, how shy that man was. Our relationship continued to be best friends. He loved Joe and Maurice very much, and they were fond of him. Then my babysitter passed away, and their father's brother and sister-in-law offered to keep them for me full-time. I thought that now I was alone, Howard would get more romantic. Nope, didn't happen. I helped him overhaul his car while we were doing this. His pa came home from lunch, stopped at the driveway, put his hands on his hips, and spoke to Howard in German. A red-faced Howard just shook his head no and continued to tighten down the bolts of the car. Took me a while to find out that Papa said, you better marry that girl quick. I got some friendly kisses occasionally. Howard was fun to be with. We fished, went to dinner, went to the movies, joined his family for backyard outings and barbecues. Uh, this continued for a year and a half. I received a letter from the government offering me a job in Guam doing the same kind of work I'd done in World War II. I showed the letter to Howard and asked him, what do you think? His reaction was, you really want to go to Guam? It's hot there, the living conditions are really bad, and on and on about the negatives. On our next day, he took a small box with a little diamond ring in it out of his pocket, handed it to me, saying, would you like to wear this for a while? <laughs> he didn't say, will you marry me? Still shy. The next get together, the family gathered, we showed the ring to everyone, and Ma very quickly went in the house and didn't come out for a while. I thought, oh my goodness, she's not pleased. She came back out later and said, Howard, you could go, but the dog stays. She was talking about the dog I had given Howard. As weeks went by, he kept asking me when I was taking my vacation. When I asked why, he would just say, just cause. Well, he and I scheduled our vacations at the same time. Still no discussion about what we would be doing. I was ironing my clothes and the phone rings and it's Ma. And she said, what's going on with you kids? My answer was, Ma, what do you mean? Ma said, well, Howard asked me to pack a suitcase for him. I asked if he was going on his honeymoon. And he said, yes. Yeah. I said to her, who with? <laughs> he was still a little shy. A little while later, he arrived at my house, and I tell him about Ma's and my discussion. And he said, well, aren't we? I asked him to sit down, and I told him, I was not a mind reader, and I would like to know what his plans were. He thought he would go by Berkeley, get Kay and Slim, go to Reno, and get married. That evening, we went to Ma and Pa's to tell everybody the plans. Pa had a different idea. He told us he'd always wanted to have one of his kids get married at his home. One problem. In those days, a blood test was required to get a marriage license. That took about three days. I called my good friend, Dr. Smith. He told me that if I'd come to his office the next morning at 8 a.m., he'd get the test done stat, and that'd be ready by 4 p.m. The next morning, we gave our blood. I went back at 4 p.m. Howard told me to wait in the car, and he would pick up the forms. He came out with a long face, and he told me that the lab dropped my vial and broke it. 
so we'd have to do it all over again tomorrow. I started crying. He actually hugged me and said, just kidding. <laughs> what a way to start a life with a man with that kind of humor. Cake was ordered. We asked Bill and Bonnie to be our best man at Matron of Honor. Called Kay and Slim, went to my dad's to give him directions to the Wygan home, arranged for a pastor. By the time I was ready to collapse. We were ready for the ceremony to start, but Dad and Kay and Slim weren't there yet. Dad called and informed us he'd gotten into town and realized the directions were in his other trousers. Trousers. When's the last time you heard somebody use that word? So he said, go on without me. Howard's brother-in-law said he'd stand in for the father of the bride. Kay and Slim were not there yet, so we decided to start the ceremony. We were about ready to say our I do's when the door opens and Aunt Kay said, we're here. Oops, sorry. It was time for the shy groom to kiss his bride. It was a quick kiss from a blushy groom. I really did marry a wonderful man. We just missed our 56th anniversary by four months. He was pop to Joe and Maurice. They used the name of White Ant from the beginning and in 1959 had their names legally changed. Maurice had the courtroom in tears when he told the judge all the reasons he wanted to be the son of Pop Howard Wygant. So that is the story. And many of you probably know that Maurice uh, died in a diving accident. And so those are some of the stories in her own words. Oh, there was one other thing. She had a little section here called Many Blessings Have Come My Way. This was written seven years ago. My 95 years have brought me many blessings. Wonderful grandparents who raised me from the age of three to almost nine. An exceptional stepdad who loved mother and I dearly. He was my daddy from the day he and mama were married. Teachers who taught me many skills. Some remained friends until their death. The doctor's family who took me in when my mother became ill. The family remained very close for a lifetime. Hundreds of family and friends who I've loved dearly and they loved me back. Three marriages, two to the same man. He grew up and matured over the 60 years that we were apart. And Howard Wygant, the light of my life, we knew each other for almost 58 years. Our marriage lasted 55 years and eight months until our Lord called him home. Then Joe Power came back into my life and we both needed each other. Another almost 10 years with each other again. Had we remained married the first time, we would have celebrated 75 years. And by the way, Marcy and Joe got married on the same day, both wedding dates. That way, Joe wouldn't have to remember another anniversary <laughs> date. Uh, Marcy's career, she had a variety of things. She was a riveter on the gunner's tail when she was rosy. She was an auto mechanic, as you heard already described. She was a bookkeeper, a tax preparer. She owned and operated Quilter's Paradise for 20 years. And then she sold it. And when those folks were ready to close it up, they offered to give it back to her. She said, it's a little late in life for me to do that again. Uh, her hobbies were sewing, quilting, beading, writing stories, songs, and poetry. She loved swap meets, reading. She collected green glassware. She collected frogs, as you can tell down here. She loved to play cards. Two of the games I think she played with some of you all in the RV club were play nine and hand and foot. All right, we play hand and foot. All right, we like that game. Sometimes we have to call Oklahoma, though, to get the rules right. <laughs> uh, she got to travel a lot, of course, uh, tow and go RV since 1947. She went cross-country three times in an RV. She also went to Alaska. When I asked about her favorite foods, the first answer I got was no gravy. I'm not sure what happened when she was an Okie girl because maybe she just had way too much gravy, all right? But she did not like gravy. She liked meat, and then I, my writing got bad. Beer rocks? Yeah. Meat and beer rocks were two of her favorite things. Uh, dessert candy. Reese's and peanut brittle were two of her favorites. Restaurants to go to, more for the company and the entertainment than the food, I think, but Roger Rockas. And uh, I know one of you all called Roger Rockus to inform them there. Somebody, Sally, made the call. And uh, they, that's how well they knew her there. <clears throat> they wanted to know, and they were very saddened by that. Yosemite Falls and Chick-fil-A. <laughs> Favorite things to watch on TV, Jeopardy and Wheel of Fortune. Favorite style of music was gospel music. 
You know that she was a member of the Toe and Go RV Club. She was also a member of Weight Watchers, and she was a member of something called Force. All right, is anybody here from Force? Okay, tell me exactly what Force stands for. F O R C E. Fresno Organization of Retired City Employees. Okay, we knew it was Retired City Employees. It was the Fresno Organization. I couldn't quite get figured out. All right. And um, so those were the things that she participated in. Her faith, she was raised by godly grandparents and a mother of faith. She accepted Jesus, she said, in her early teens. She was baptized in 1934. Marcy and Joe uh, were influenced and invited to New Hope by Fred and Barbara Rao and Sally and Bruce Wan. Marcy shared with me on several occasions. She said, Tim, the first time we walked in here, Joe and I knew we were home. And right there where that quilt is, that was their seats. That's where they sat every Sunday. And after Joe, Joe left us, that is still where she preferred to sit when she came to church. Um, and they joined here in 2012, and we had Captain Joe's service here May the 30th of 2014. As I met with family and friends, these are some words that they shared with me that described Marcy for them. As you listen to this list of words, maybe there's a word that pops into your mind, and I'll give you a chance just to shout it out right from where you're seated. But uh, when we talked about it the other day, they said she was intelligent. She was strong-willed. <laughs> she would give you the shirt off her back. She was generous. She was fun and funny. She was positive. She loved life. She was perky. Uh, she was spunky. Uh, but don't do her wrong. All right? Don't do her wrong. She had a wonderful sense of humor. And she was styling. She always was stylish with her dress. She did not dress like a woman of 102, all right? Um, I would have worn a pink shirt today, except I don't have one anymore, because that was her favorite color. Um, and she was here the Sunday when I wore this belt and these shoes that I'm wearing. And I, I grew up in a culture you did not wear brown with navy blue, okay? You, you just didn't do that, but now that's the thing. And somebody made comments, and I made a public statement about it. And afterwards, Marcy said, Tam, you just let your wife keep dressing you, all right? She said, you're in style now. So anyway, those were a few of the things. It's great that Joe was able to be with us today. And Joe wants to say a few things about his mom. Oh, just before that, though, I didn't give you a chance. Shout out. Is there a word or a thought that describes Marcy for you? Friendly. Friendly. She liked to win at cards. She liked to win. Did she cheat? No. No, okay, all right. But she really liked, so she was competitive. Wonderful. A wonder? Wonderful. Wonderful. Best friend in five minutes. All right. Love Glitz and Blaine. Yes, she did. Glitz and Blaine. And I, and I think you do too. Uh -huh. Yeah. Hilarious. Hilarious. Positive. 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 Yeah. All right. Good. She loved quilting. She loved quilting. All everything. All the quilts. Even that one on that chair. It fit the. It fit the display up here. So I added that quilt over there. But all of these are just samples of what she's done. Well, other thoughts that come, you can share them over at the reception as you're sitting around the table having some lunch. I'm going to give this microphone to Joe so that Joe can say a few things about his mama. Good morning, everybody. Sorry I was a little late. Circumstances have begun my control. And, uh, I just want to talk a little bit about my remembrances of the most wonderful mother a guy could ever have. First of all, her choice in men was outstanding. My, um, I don't remember my father Joe until after um, and I'll tell you about that in a minute but um, she married my stepfather Howard 
and uh, my little brother Maurice and I started calling him Uncle Howard because that's what uh, my cousins called him. And then uh, eventually my little brother and I had a little conversation and we talked to mom and said we got to call him something besides uncle. And she said, how about pop? And she said, that fits okay. So that's how I knew him. And I couldn't have had a better father than Pop. And Pop passed away. And sometime later, and I think Pastor Tim told this story. I, I'm a little hard of hearing, but anyway, uh, Mom remarried. My real father, Joe Fowler. And uh, at first I was very skeptical because of the history between the two and my father leaving my mother for another lady. But anyway, I uh, got to know him, and he turned out to be one of the greatest persons I've ever met. So my mother's choice in men, Howard, and what people call Captain Power, my uh, mother to me will always be the most crafty woman I ever known. <clears throat> you ever notice all the uh, quotes? Somebody may have talked about it, but uh, I think it was a great idea to display those because those were those were things that my mother crafted by hand. My first remembrance of Mom's crafty was um, about 1948 or so. She started making shell jewelry. She went out to the beach and gathered seashells and put them together in earrings and necklaces and. What she do? She didn't go to a craft show and sell them. She gave them all the way. So then other crafty things she did, soap carving and uh, uh, some little things with uh, stained glass. And uh, But the most uh, impressive things, I think, is her quilting. I can always remember her sitting in that chair in the living room and quilting all hours in the day. And that's the result of many of those quilts you see here. And I believe we're going to uh, what is that correct, Cheryl? Sure. I can't hear her. Yeah. Yeah, we'll talk about it later. Anyway, we'll do that. Um, the only thing I can say plainly about my mother is she was the greatest person I've ever met. We've tried to get her to write a book, but she never did. But anyway, thank you, thank you all for coming. A lot of people that knew her.
Thank you. Again, thank you. Thank you, buddy. Great job. Thank you for sharing. We put together some pictures throughout her um, 102 year lifetime. This could be an hour, but it's not. All right. Uh, just sit back and watch and enjoy all the different clothes styles, hairstyles, and looks that she gave us through the years.
we found out who was part of the uh, Toe and Go group, and that's back there. Let's find out a couple of others uh, groups that are here. If uh, you are family, you are part of Marcy's family, would you stand up? I think it's most of them on the run. All right. You can stand up. You're married into the family, so you're part of it. All right. Yeah, if you're married to that, very good. All right. Thank you all for being together. And I know there's some from out of state that couldn't be here, but we're glad you are. If you are from church, you knew her from church, would you stand up? I know some of the New Hope crowd are here. All right. There, there, there. A couple up here. All right. Good, good, good. And then you fall, you find yourself like friends, like family, caregivers, good friends. Stand up. I know there's some up here, back there. All right. And if I missed a group, stand up. <laughs> Did I get everybody covered? Thank you all from the various areas and time periods of our life for being here. Let me set perspective, maybe if I can, one last time. Uh, all of my family was from Oklahoma, just like Marcy was from there. So my entire life, I have made anywhere from one to four trips a year to Oklahoma. I uh, made that journey down Route 66, then I-40. Uh, it's well over a hundred times in my lifetime. I've been through the Mojave Desert a lot. And I gotta tell you, I don't see much wildlife anytime I go through the Mojave Desert. Quite frankly, the only thing I remember seeing are buzzards. And they're roaming the road looking for roadkill. I came across a uh, National Geographic article a couple of years ago that caught me really by surprise. I discovered that there is another animal that thrives in the Mojave Desert. I've never seen it. The other bird is a, the, the other animal is a bird as well. It's a hummingbird. I thought all of them used to be in my backyard at the feeder, but come to find out they exist and thrive in the desert as well. Two very different birds, one very large, one very small. One really ugly, one really cute. They have very different appetites. One looks for what is dead and gone. They live off what was. The other one survives off the sweet nectar of the blossoms of the cactus plants, lives off what is new and fresh. And the point of the contrast of those two birds in that very same environment is this. Both birds find exactly what they're looking for. You and I find ourselves in the same place in the same environment today. And we will probably find exactly what we're looking for. The question is, did you come to find sorrow or did you come to find joy? There's a lot of joy to be had today. There's not much sorrow in celebrating someone who has lived a hundred and two years. There's not much sorrow in celebrating the life of someone who lived 102 years and up until a week and a half before they died, they still lived alone in their own home. There's not much sorrow to realize that a woman was still telling jokes into the last few minutes of her life. There was a lot of joy to be found. And then we add to that, or actually we build those things off of what I think is the key that made her life really what it was. And that was her faith. It started early in her life. It permeated her life. And let me tell you why I love Marcy as a pastor. Because not everybody allows their faith to impact their sense of humor positively. I have known some pretty sad Christians. And I like to tell them, don't tell them where you go to church. <laughs> Somehow, somewhere, preachers got the idea in history past that you had to be somber and sober to be a believer. And nothing could be further from the truth. God has an incredible sense of humor. And if you don't believe that, just look around you. I look in the mirror every day and I chuckle. This is what God has made. There was a young boy who went to spend a weekend with his grandfather at the farm. While he was walking around, he noticed the chickens. They were scratching and playing around like chickens do. And the little lad said, they ain't got it. 
He continued walking around, and next thing he saw in his grandfather's field was a colt, a young colt, playing, kicking up its heels. And he looked at it and said, no, he ain't got it. Kept looking around at some of the other animals, and uh, every time he looked at him, he said, no, ain't got it. Finally, he found an old donkey in the stall of the barn. And when he saw the donkey's long, frowning face and the way the donkey stood there, he screamed at his grandfather and said, Come quick, come quick, I found it, I found it. The grandfather said, What'd you find, son? Papa, I found an animal that has the same kind of religion you have. <laughs> Unfortunately, that sometimes happens, but that wasn't Marcy. Marcy was the best advertisement for faith because she firmly believed what the wisest man who ever lived wrote in the book of Proverbs, chapter 15. Laughter is good medicine for the soul. Laughter is good medicine for the soul. And I don't think God will mind if I add just a little bit to that verse. It is good medicine for the soul and anything else that ails you. Laughter is good for us. Laughter is like a shock absorber. If we want to have less stress in our lives, we need to learn to laugh in and through our circumstances. We must find the fun in the frustrating. Somebody once asked President Lincoln how he handled all the stresses of the Civil War. And he said, if it hadn't been for laughter, I'd have never made it. A lot of famous comedians grew up in poor neighborhoods and they had lots of problems and they coped with their troubles by learning to be funny and learning how to laugh. Here's what I believe. If we can laugh at it, we can live through it. And I think Marcy is a key example of that. There are lots of folks who have wonderful quotes about laughter. Will Rogers said, I don't know any jokes. I just watch the government and report the facts. <laughs> Boy, would he be laughing today. <laughs> uh, Teresa of Avila, the, she was a nun, a Spanish nun. And she said, she who laughs, laughs. I think Marcy proved that, all right? Uh, the, the nun used to say, I looked for young novice nuns who knew how to laugh, eat, and sleep. She believed that if they ate heartily, they were healthy. If they slept well, they were more likely free of serious sin. And if they laughed, they had the necessary disposition to survive a difficult life. A Jewish proverb says, what soap is to the body, laughter is to the soul. Mark Twain said, laughter is the greatest weapon that we humans possess, and it's the one we use the least. Milton Berle said, laughter is an instant vacation. And Victor Borga, you all are old enough to know who that is, right? Most of you. Yeah, okay, all right. Yeah, Victor Borga said, laughter is the shortest distance between two people. I think you said Marcy became your best friend in five minutes. I think part of that was the laughter that took place. Sometimes all we can do is laugh. I think we should take Solomon's advice a lot more often, and that is, let laughter be a good medicine for our soul. Do any of you remember the Burma shave signs that used to be out on the old highways? The one-liners, you know, that went like this. Within this veil of toil and sin, your head grows bald, <laughs> but not your chin. Don't lose your head to gain a minute. You need your head. Your brains are in it. That's kind of what Solomon did when he wrote the book of Proverbs. There are over 50 verses of joy and laughter in the book of Proverbs. It's kind of our Burma shave signs. And I think we need to read those a lot more often. What, what is the opposite of joy and laughter? Sadness and discouragement, tears. Discouragement, somebody said it like this. Discouragement is dissatisfaction with the past, distaste for the present, and a distrust of the future. It is ingratitude for the blessings of yesterday, it's indifference to the opportunities of today, and it is insecurity regarding the strength of tomorrow. Discouragement, it's unawareness of the presence of beauty, it's unconcern for the needs of our fellow man, and it's unbelief in the promises of old. It is impatience with time, it is immaturity of thought, and it is impoliteness to God. Happiness, 
and discouragement are issues of the heart and what's our perspective. That is the reason that Jesus Christ came 2,000 years ago at Christmas time. It's why we have a Christmas time to be born in a manger, to die on a cross. Love came down. God as a man. And then as man dying for us because we could never pay the debt of our own sinfulness. And when he did that, he takes and gives us forgiveness from the crappy stuff we've done. He removes the guilt from the things that bring us shame. And he said, I've come to give you life, life more abundant. And the abundant life is not money, cars, watches, fancy things. The abundant life is two things. One, it's the longevity, eternal life. By the way, folks, We're not celebrating the fact that Marcy's dead today because she ain't dead. She's more alive today than she's ever been in her 102 years. She's just absent from us. But we have this incredible hope that we can be with her again. That was her hope. She was ready. Well, the last thing she said to me is she says, I can't wait to see your mama when I get to heaven. She said, your mother always used to bring people over to visit with me and introduce them to me at church. My mama passed away just a couple of years um, after Marcy started coming here, but she said, I can't. She said she loved that red dress, didn't she? My mama loved red. But that's what Jesus came to do. He came to bring us life. He came to offer us not only his presence in this life, but our home in the next life with him. I don't know what you think about heaven. If you think it's what some artist rendered as a cloud and sitting on a pillowy cloud with a harp and strumming it, guys, that would be hell to me. (laughs) There is nothing heavenly about that. God says in the scriptures, the eye has not seen, nor has the mind imagined how incredible heaven will be. Let your mind go wild. And where Marcy is, is better than that. Joy, discouragement. I can't make you choose which perspective. But faith would love to give us a perspective of joy. Does it come easy? No. It's to learn. It is Paul who said from a prison cell with a beaten, bruised, and bloodied back, he said, I've learned to be content. What a beautiful word. Let me wrap this up. I don't know how many of you know the name Johnny Erickson Tata. A few of you are nodding your heads. I I had the privilege of meeting Johnny when she was in her early 20s and again at Chuck Colson's funeral service. But she was a young lady that was involved in a diving accident, very similar to Maurice's, but it didn't kill her, but it paralyzed her from the neck down. She is uh, just a couple of years older than I am, and she has written multiple books, and she learned how to paint. She was crafty. Like Marcy, she learned how to paint with a brush between her teeth. She's done beautiful artwork as well as writing some incredible books. Here's what she says about joy. Honesty is always the best policy, but especially when you're surrounded by a crowd of women in a restroom during a break at a Christian women's conference. (laughs) One woman putting on lipstick said, Oh, Johnny, you always look so together, so happy in your wheelchair. I wish we had your joy. Several women around her nodded. How do you do it? She asked as this woman put on her lipstick. I don't do it. Johnny said. In fact, may I tell you honestly how I woke up this morning? This is my average day. After my husband, Ken, leaves for work at 6 a.m., I'm alone until the front door opens at 7 a.m., and then a friend arrives to get me out of bed. While I listen to her make coffee, I pray, Oh, Lord, My friend will soon give me a bath, get me dressed, sit me in my chair, brush my hair and my teeth, and send me out the door. Lord, I don't have the strength to face this routine one more time. My resources are depleted. I don't have a smile to take into this day. But I believe you do. May I have yours, Lord? I need it desperately. 
One of the ladies looked after her after she said that, and she said, so what happens when your friend comes through the bedroom door? I turn my head towards her, Johnny said, and I give her a smile sent straight from heaven. It's not mine, it's God's. And so, whatever joy you see in me today, Johnny said, was prayed for this morning. I have learned the weaker I become, the more I trust the Lord. And the more we trust the Lord, the stronger he is in us. Billy Graham might be a name you recognize. He said in a message called Saved or Lost in Texas in 1965, he said, one of the fruits of the Spirit is joy. You might not be able to work up joy yourself, but God in the Holy Spirit living inside of you can produce that joy supernaturally. And the children of God must have joy. He wrapped it up by saying this, but a Christian being a Christian is to have joy. That's one of the greatest characteristics of the Christian life is the joy that we have. And if you don't have this joy, if you don't have his peace, then maybe you need to search your heart and find out if you really have Jesus. It's a good question for us to ask today. It's a question that Marcy and I hope you could answer with, yes, I have Jesus. Here's the kicker, folks. You don't have to be in church to invite Jesus in your life. You don't even have to go to church. In fact, I'm not even going to invite you to church. We do have three services every Sunday, though, at 8 and 9. <laughs> there was a thief that hung on each side of the cross the day Jesus was crucified. One of them cursed Jesus because that was his perspective. He made fun of Jesus. And the other one, had a different perspective. He said, I'm getting what I deserve. But Jesus, you're not. You don't deserve this. And then here's his prayer. It can be your prayer. It's not fancy. He looked at Jesus and said, will you remember me when you come into your kingdom? Will you remember me when you get to the Father's house? And what did Jesus say? Go do 15 Hail Marys first. Go to church 10 times. Give a large contribution. Jesus said, today, you will be with me. That's where Marcy is. That's where you and I can be when that moment comes for us. All you have to do is believe that Jesus didn't deserve that. He took what we deserved so he could give to us what we don't deserve. His love, his peace, his forgiveness. Most of all in the world we live in, his joy. Let's pray. Father, all I can say is thank you for the blessing of getting to be Marcy's pastor for these last 12, 13, 14 years. It has been a thrill. It is never dull when Marcy is in the room. She puts a smile on your face if you don't have one already. Father, she's put a smile on my face so many times these last few days. I want to thank you for her life. I want to thank you for her faith in you. I want to thank you for the love that she shared with so many. I want to thank you that her son paid tribute to her by saying, I love the choice my mom made in men. I want to thank you, Father, for the friendships that she developed. And I want to thank you for the opportunity to honor her life today. I pray for your peace to be available to all who are here, your comfort. You tell us you're the God of all comfort. That tells us we're going to go through things in life where we need comfort. comfort. And so I trust we turn to you today. May we walk away from here with a treasure chest full of memories of Marcy. And when we have a tough time finding our own joy, may we think back about Marcy's and may we borrow hers. And most of all, Father, when we can't seem to muster up our own joy, May we remember we can ask you for yours. You'll be happy to give it to us. We thank you for all this and so much more. In the incredible name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen and amen. 
All right, I'm going to dismiss you here in just a moment. Let me give you a, uh, uh, just some information, all right? Uh, all of you were invited to stay for lunch. There is plenty of food. You have tri-tip, you have chicken, you have rice, you have salad, you've got fruit sticks, you've got all kinds of homemade desserts over there, all right? There is plenty. You've got a crew of people who are going to serve you over there. They're going to wait on you, so let them do it. Um, when I dismiss you in just a moment, even though this is a country church, we do have indoor plumbing. So we have bathrooms and all the buildings here. The ladies' room is on my left. The men's room is on my right here. And the, the reception area around here, we call it the barn. All right? In the barn, it has restrooms as well. There'll be signage up that you'll see. When you leave this building, whether you go out these side doors or you go out the back door, just find a sidewalk and go that way. Okay? It will take you to the large gray building. That is the barn. The doors are open. They're ready to serve you. When you leave, please feel free to come by here. Look at some of the pictures that are up here. Look at her frogs. Get a better look at the quilts. These will remain up for about an hour. Okay, So if you want to go eat and come back over for a little bit and take a look, it will be open for you to do that as well. So I'm just going to do this because I think that's the way Marcy would want you're all family to her today. So all of you were dismissed. Let's go have lunch, okay? On your table, you'll find these, all right? Please take one with you, all right? This is from her 100th birthday, right, Cheryl? Was this her? Okay, I think this is from her 100th birthday, so take one home with you. 